Here we go. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross. Then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven accepted redeemed by his grace let the house of the lord sing praise we were the beggars now we're royalty we were the prisoners now we're running free we are forgiven morning. Well, let me say this again. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Mark's. Um, we're continuing a sermon series called Asterisk. Everybody say asterisk. Asterisk. It's a hard word to say, I know. Uh, and you know how you see in documents that there's an asterisk, and it always means there's something more to learn. There's something more to know. And we're going to look at a text today from Luke 21, verses 1 through 6. We're going to talk about that text because there's a little bit more to know there. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to tell you a story that happened to me this last week. And uh, it was last Sunday. Uh, my family and I, we were out of town, and we had gone to uh, a family wedding. And we got back into town, and we got back from a long drive from Minnesota. We, we pulled into our parking lot, and Ellie and I noticed somebody going door to door. Now, there, there are only a few people that will go door to door, right? So you only have a few options. It can be uh, somebody who's trying to sell you something. Hopefully, they're fancy steak knives. That's always great. Or, I'm just going to say this, or it's a, it, it's a Mormon. I'm sorry if I offend anybody, but it's, it's a Mormon. Or it's an evangelist, right? 
And so my wife, in her whimsical way, says, hey, Paul, why don't you stay out here and see what he wants? And in my gullible way, I said, sure, why not? Should be fun. So he comes up to me. He's a young, young guy, and he comes up to me. And the first question he asked me, he goes, do you have a church home? And I said, yep, definitely do. Yep, yep. He said, uh, are, are you saved? And I said, yeah, absolutely. I'm 110% saved. How do you know that you're saved? And I said, well, I, I believe that I'm saved by grace through faith. And then he said, well, and if you were to die today, are you 100% positive that you would go to heaven? I said, 110%, brother. And uh, the conversation kind of went on. And then finally, he, get, he got to um, uh, a, a more difficult question. He said, do you believe that once you're saved, that, that you can never fall away from God ever again. Now, understand something real quick. Um, I never told him I was the pastor of St. Mark's. <laughs> I never told him I was working on a doctorate in theology. I just kind of went in the conversation. And we have differences of opinion in the Christian church about once saved, always saved. That's kind of the nomenclature for it. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, I believe that Man, if, if you turn away from God, you're not saved. I, I think John's pretty specific in that. He says those who have denied Christ have denied him. And, and of course, he started to debate me back. And, and the conversation went on. I won't bore you with the details, but, you know, he's flipping through Bible verses and, 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 and doing all kinds of stuff. This lasted for 30 minutes. Thank you, Ellie. And at the end of 30 minutes, I could tell that he was perturbed with me because I was not agreeing with him. And the last things that came out of his mouth were, I'm sorry I wasted my time on you. Yeah. And I said, God bless you. Have a good day. <laughs> um, I tell you that story because it is so easy to, especially in our society, it's so easy to get in a tit for tat with people over minor issues. Have you noticed that? Probably happens in your family, probably happens at work, probably happens just in your daily life. And here was a Christian who came to my door and we disagreed on some things and it ended up being, I'm sorry I wasted my time on you. As we're going through this series, Asterisk, we're going to talk about different scripture passages, and we're not asking you to totally agree with, you know, what we're saying all the time. You know, the, the scripture passage I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to kind of hijack what I think tradition has, has traditionally said about this scripture passage. I don't want you thinking you got to go away from here believing exactly what I say. What I do hope that you walk away from here uh, thinking is that you're willing to have a conversation, that you're willing to have a conversation because Christians need to be able to have conversations today with our brothers and sisters in our, in our town, in our society, in our world. I'm going to get back to that story here in just a second, but I want to, to now take, take you to Luke 21. So if you want to open up your Bibles, Luke 21, verses 1 through 6. Your Bible will have actually verses 1 through 4 in one section, but I'm going to continue reading a couple more verses. This is called the widow's offering, or if you're an old guy like me, you might remember it being called the widow's might, and I'll get to that in just a second. This is what uh, Luke 21 verses 1 through 6 says. It says, as Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. And there went the music, you know? That's all right. Verse 5. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, when I was a kid, I, 
my dad uh, is a pastor. And when I was a kid, there was an organization in the Lutheran church that I grew up called the LWML. The LWML stands for Lutheran Wish... Uh, Missionary. That's not it. Lutheran Missionary Women's League. Okay, and uh, this was a this is a great organization. You can go look them up today. LWML, and um, great organization where where women came together in the church and they supported missionaries. And one of the ways that they did this was with a thing called the Widow's Might Box, or just a Might Box. Now, like I said before, if you're old enough, you remember that Might M I T E not only is it a bug that you don't want around your house, right? Mites are gross. They bite, they suck blood, they're parasites, okay? That's disgusting. But mite also means very, very tiny, very, very small. And so this story has been known as the widow's mite because she gave these two small copper coins. And so the LWML would give out these widow's, these mite boxes, and you were to take your spare change and put them in there. It's kind of like rounding up at the grocery store. You ever have them ask you, would you like to round up for this or that? It's kind of the same thing with the mite box. And the LWML has raised millions of dollars over the years for missionaries, which is awesome. And in fact, the next two years, they hope to raise $2 million just through spare change. Isn't that cool? That's very, it's very, very cool. And so I grew up as a little kid, my dad would take me to, <clears throat> This is a little embarrassing. Um, my dad would take me to LWML conventions. <laughs> wow, I'm such a nerd. Um, and, and so what I would do there is I would get on the elevators in the hotels because I thought the elevators were the coolest, and I would just press all the buttons for all the ladies. I actually got money from some of the ladies for doing that. That was, that was, um, that was a scam for sure. Okay, so back to the mic boxes. So the mite boxes are all based on this story that I just read to you about this widow's mite, her two copper coins. And I'm going to kind of give a minority opinion on this passage of Scripture, but I don't think that this section of Scripture is actually commending what's going on with the widow's mite. For generation, generations, the text has been used uh, basically like this. Look at the wealthy, they gave out of their wealth, but look at this widow who gave everything she had to live on and how great is her faithfulness, right? That's what we've been taught. And it was a great text to use for capital campaigns. <laughs> I mean, who, who doesn't want to feel guilty about not giving to the church after a widow gave her two little copper coins, right? And so for years, you know, it's, it's a great sermon to, to drum up some dollars, I never used this passage in our series uh, beginning this year about money because I don't think it's an example of actually a good thing. If you'll look at the text, you'll notice that Jesus never says, wow, look at her faithfulness. How great is it that she gave everything she had to live on? It's not there. And by the way, the story is in Luke and it's in Mark. And Luke and Mark set up the story. The context of the story is the exact same. And when you look at the context, you start to understand that it's kind of weird to think that Jesus is actually saying this is a really great thing. For example, if you flip back to the chapter before this, Jesus is in uh, the last week of his life before he's crucified. And so it's Holy Week. He's in the temple courts, and he's having all these debates with the Pharisees. The Pharisees bring to him a, a coin, and they say, should we pay taxes to Caesar? And of course, we know Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and God's what is God's great answer. The Pharisees come to him with the Sadducees. These are two different religious opinion groups. They disagree on, on, on marriage um, and, and marriage in the resurrection. And so they come to him, they say, what do you think about marriage and the resurrection? Jesus gives a great answer. Jesus tells a parable of the tenants, both Luke and Mark set this all up like this, and he says the wicked tenants are those people who have rejected all the prophets, and now they're rejecting the son, and the Pharisees realize that he's talking about them, and so they try to kill him now. And then finally, right before this text, Jesus says this, beware of the Pharisees, because they like to go around and parade themselves and make big deals about who they are so that everybody would think they're really awesome, 
But what they're actually doing, and listen to these words, they're devouring widows' houses. Now, who do we just read about? A widow. What's Jesus talking about? Well, the Pharisees would love when widows would come to them out of reverence, out of dedication to the temple and say, hey, you can have all that I have as long as it's used for God. And they would just be thrilled. They'd be like, this is exactly what you need to be doing. Look at, look at this faithfulness. But the problem is this. Widows had so little already. They were some of the most vulnerable people in society in Jesus' days. And so when Jesus says the Pharisees, they devour widows' homes, he's setting up this next scene where he's sitting and he's watching the wealthy bring money and he's watching this widow bring two small copper coins. And the scene right after it that I read to you is the same spot, same issue. The disciples say to Jesus as they're sitting there, look at this temple, isn't it beautiful? And Jesus says, not a stone will remain on another stone. The value is not the temple, Jesus is saying. And so what do we do with that context? You hear what's going on? Jesus is in some way condemning the Pharisees and their way of religion. And before the passage and after the passage, he's saying this temple is is not what you need to be giving to because it's not going to last much longer. So the, the context is very much against the religious system that the Pharisees had set up. It would be weird, and this is what I'm sharing this morning, it would be weird for Jesus in the midst of this context to be excited about a widow who gave all that she had to live on. Literally, the Greek says she gave two lepta, which left her approximately about one one hundredth of a day's wages. So imagine you're making $20 an hour, you're working eight hours a day. That's $160 a day. One one hundredth of 160 is a dollar sixty. Am I doing this right? I think so. So she literally had $3.20 to live off of. Why this is weird, because it would be like Jesus coming to a Salvation Army Sunday morning and being thrilled to see all of the homeless people giving all of their money in the offering basket. That doesn't make any sense. They need that money to live off of. It would be, it would be like St. Mark's having you know, a, 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 big, a big event for homeless people in our community and then passing around an offering basket saying, would you mind giving what, what you have? Not actually, let me take that back. Not giving what you have, give us all the money that you have. Not only is that weird, but in my opinion, that's rude. And the Pharisees don't see it because they're preoccupied with their system of religion and with their temple. I ultimately think this is the point of the text, that Jesus is not commending what's happening here, but instead he's pointing it out and saying, there's something wrong here with our religion. So just humor me for a second. Let's just say I'm right. By the way, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, for the first time in my life, I read a commentary. Commentaries are scholars who have written on the Bible. For the first time in my life, I actually found a scholar that actually agrees with me. That doesn't happen very often. Um, in, in fact, not very often at all. Yeah. But Joel Green, in his commentary, says the same thing. He says, look at the context around here. Something's out of whack. Maybe Jesus is not commending this. And maybe we've misused this passage over the years. So if what Joel Green is saying and what Pastor Paul is saying is true, then what is the point of this passage? Well, let me give you my opinion. This is Jesus' continual warning and fight against the abuse of religion. And he was doing this the last week of his life over and over and over and over again. And it's what got him crucified on some level. He went up against the system, and they crucified him. What's abuse of religion? Abuse of religion is when religion is used to control, manipulate, or to induce and pile on guilt. 
That is abuse of religion. And the Pharisees were really kind of good at it. They were good at controlling and manipulating. They had added lots of laws to the law of God. They had added a lot of these little details that people couldn't keep. And so that kept the people in control and they manipulated them. This is, this is why Micah in the Old Testament, and John Mazinski is going to preach on this in a few weeks. This is why Micah from Micah 6 verse 6 basically says, hey, God doesn't want all your offering and all your bulls and rams and all your olive oil and all this stuff. In fact, Micah uses hyperbole and he says, you could bring tens of thousands of gallons of olive oil and that won't be enough to appease the Lord. You could bring thousands of rams, that won't be enough. In fact, and then Micah uses this terrible thing in Old Testament. He says, you can even bring your firstborn child, sacrifice that child, and that's not what God wants. What does God want? Well, God desires justice. He wants you to love mercy, and he wants you to walk humbly with him. You see, Micah's saying that's true religion. The people in Micah's day were saying, how do we go about this? Where, where's God? He seems like he's far from us. So should we offer more offering? Should we do more for God? And Micah's saying, no, 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 no. Turn your hearts to God instead. What is justice? Well, James talks about true religion in the New Testament. He says true religion is taking care of widows and orphans, not their money, taking care of them. Micah says true religion is loving mercy, not con condemnation. True religion is walking humbly with the Lord every day. Humility is something we need more than ever in our society. Abuse of religion is when religion is used to control or manipulate, and especially when religion is used to induce guilt. My friends, guilt is the enemy of grace. It is the tool of the devil to make you feel like you're not good enough. Now, I'm not talking about immoral living. I'm not talking about feeling sorry for your sins. I'm not talking about there's no need for confession, but what I'm saying is that the devil wants you to feel like you're unworthy. And then what the devil does on top of that is he piles and he says, well, see, so you're unworthy, so you got to do these things to be worthy. And that's guilt. And that kills off grace. And Jesus did not come to tell you that you're guilty. Jesus came to tell you that he's bringing grace into your life. You know, I think the, the question for us today as we look at a text like this is whether or not we are stuck in this system of religion, in this abuse, or are we following Jesus in a relationship with him? I, I once heard, and you've probably heard this before, somebody commented that Christianity is, a, is not a religion, it's a relationship. Well, that's totally true. Christianity is also a religion, but it is about a relationship with Jesus. What we practice here at St. Mark's, what we believe here as Christians is, is not that we're working a system, but that we're walking with a Savior. What we believe here at St. Mark's is, is we're not here to tell everybody they're guilty, but to tell everybody that there's grace for them. We believe that we're here to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, who, in my opinion in this text, is weeping over this widow. I don't know. Maybe he was crying, maybe he wasn't. But I kind of see him sitting there in the temple courts going, oh my goodness, where has this all gone wrong? And you'll remember at the beginning of John's gospel, what, is, what does Jesus do in the temple? He turns over the tables, he's so upset the money changers, which is a whole nother sermon. I think Jesus is weeping over this widow and he's thinking to himself this week that he's gonna die on the cross for her. If only she would have known that I'm about to pay the price for her that she cannot pay. If she would only know that I am the offering that she needs. If she would only know that I am the lamb of sacrifice that takes away the sin of the world. If she would only know that one day all of my followers are going to be the temple of God. 
where God's Holy Spirit makes his dwelling in us, not this building. I think Jesus is in this moment thinking to himself, oh, my dear widow, my dear wealthy, my dear disciples, and even my dear Pharisees, you don't need this temple. You need me. Back to the story of the evangelist who came to my house and abruptly stopped my vacation. Religion says, I've wasted my time on you. A relationship with Jesus says, how can I be there for you? Religion says, do this or that for salvation. Jesus says, put your faith in me because I am the way, the truth, and the life. Religion says, you're guilty. Jesus says, you're loved. And so my question for you today is, which voice are you hearing? Which path are you following? The one of religion or the one of relationship with Jesus? I would, I would invite you today to follow Jesus. He's never, never going to let you down. He's never going to tell you you're not good enough, you're not worthy. Instead, he's always going to stretch out his arms and tell you that you are his child, and that you're precious, and that you're loved. If you're stuck in religion, and you feel that guilt, and you you constantly come back to this nagging feeling that you've got to do more, I would encourage you today to break those chains and let them go, and simply turn your life to Christ, because he'll lift you up. He'll lift you up because he loves you. Are you following religion or are you following Jesus? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that today we are here to hear your word and sing your praises in this beautiful place, that all the earth is yours and that we are in your house today. So God, help us to see Jesus Help us to see his love and his grace and not the the system of religion that can so easily entangle us. God, make us humble. Teach us to love mercy and to walk with you. We thank you for your son who gave his life for us so that we don't have to pay the price, but that our price has been paid, our debt has been paid. Jesus, we love you so much. We thank you for sending your spirit who is present here today. And we celebrate your love for us. In his name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Hey, give me just a second to get everything organized again up here. And uh, while I'm doing that, you can talk to your neighbor and say on a 1 to 10 scale, do you think that Joel Green, the commentator, and Pastor Paul have it right or not? On a one to scale 10, 10, we got it right. One, we're utter failures. I don't hear a lot of comments out there, nor do I hear a lot of tens. Thank you very much. Um, But with that said, uh, it leads me into the next just conversation I want to have, and and we're going to just go into a time of prayer here before we uh, finish out our worship. You know, I say that jokingly to, to, you know, give me a a score, because that's not really what it's about. And if you walk away from here going, man, I love that passage, and it's about this widow and her faithfulness, that's, that's good too. Because here's the deal. We're brothers and sisters in Christ, and before disunity And before disagreement, there's always unity in the blood of the Lamb. And so I just want to bring up the elephant that is in our country right now. And and, uh, unless you're living under a rock this week, you know that Roe versus Wade was 
overturned. And I want to just make an acknowledgement here real quick. First of all, we have differences of opinion within the church about this. And they're political, uh, they're social, they're religious, they're all kinds of difference in agreements. And I would encourage you uh, to be humble about your responses to this change in our, in our society and our law. The other thing is this, though. At St. Mark's, we believe in the sanctity of life. We believe in the sanctity of life in the womb and outside. We believe in the sanctity of life of, you know, little kids and even teenagers. I'm just kidding, teenagers. I love you. We believe in the sanctity of life of widows and of orphans and of elderly, and of middle-aged, and people who are dying. We believe that every moment of life is sacred because God makes it sacred, because God is the author of life. That is something that we can be united on. And I encourage you to find that that common ground. So I know that uh, it seems like the world is even more divided today, but in my opinion, the church is the place of unity. And so today I'm going to just pray for um, moms with, with children in their womb that they might not want. I want to pray for community resources that help women who are pregnant. And I'm going to pray for the church that we might open our doors more than ever uh, today. So we please stand. Let's join together in prayer. So, Heavenly Father, um, we just humble ourselves before you today. Before we put out the Facebook posts and the tweets and the different comments, I pray that you would move in us your spirit and the mind of Christ so that we would speak boldly and with love, that we would show grace and humility in all of our conversations, that we would move towards a place of listening and learning more than anger and frustration. Lord, move in us as your church. I pray for all the churches in Cedar Rapids. I pray that we would have open doors to, to all women who are struggling with unwanted pregnancies. God, I pray for women who can't get pregnant and so, so desire to have a child. Lord, I pray that you'd open up our eyes to adoption. I pray that you would move in your people. You call us your adopted children. Lord, I pray for the different pregnancy resource centers around town. God, that you would use them to provide education and encouragement. Most of all, God, I pray that you would use your people that we would come along the side of every person of every life to give to show them dignity and to give them hope and the message of good news of Jesus Christ. So Lord, this is our prayer today. We know that you hear us and we thank you that you sent your son, your son who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.